A celebration of love in the springtime of the year, a reading from the Song of Solomon. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The word of the Lord. Let us join together in reading the words of Psalm 45. My heart is sure in the middle of Psalm. <coughs> teachings on the meaning of true religion, doing God's word. A reading from the letter of James. Every generous act of giving, with every perfect gift, is from above, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourself of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the imperfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are righteous and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the word. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Presence. But those who fear you, you continue to 
Jesus denounces those who find ways to ignore the genuine commandments of God. And he calls people to the awareness that, only, that the only evil which can corrupt comes from within. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of the disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they thoroughly washed their hands, just observe, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and scribes ask him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold the human traditions. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person which by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, adverse, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, and every action of all our lives be always acceptable to you, Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I wonder if you noticed the organization of the psalm we just said. It's helpful when you're reading the psalm to read it over quickly one time and, and look at what is, how it's organized, who's speaking and who's not. In this case, the psalm is actually in two parts. The first part would be a question to God, a question from the congregation asking God something. And then we hear the answer. The question is, Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle? Who may abide upon your holy hill? If we were to write that psalm today, we might say, Lord, who will get into heaven? Well, we actually might say, who besides me will get into heaven? <laughs> Unfortunately, though, if you read the rest of it, God's answer is anything but comforting. Based on God's answer, Heaven's going to be a very lonely place with few, frankly, if any people present. God says, whoever leads a blameless life and does what is right, who speaks the truth from his heart. I mean, seriously, who can live up to that standard? Then we flip over to the gospel. Now, this, what the scribes and the Pharisees were doing was actually pretty important. They come and they, they ask Jesus essentially the question that's being asked in the psalm. They want to know why the disciples ate without washing their hands. Now, understand this is not washing their hands in the sanitary sense. This means a ritualistic action, a ritualistic washing of hands. Notice how it talks about the rituals of washing pots and other things. A, tiny remnant of this remains when each week the acolyte takes what's called a lavavo bowl, the little silver bowl, and pours water over my hands. My hands are not cleaner as a result of those few drops of water. In fact, me going over to the corner and using the sanitizer is much more important than that bit of water. But the ritual is important. The scribes and the Pharisees saw this ritual as important because it was their job to help the people leave a, lead a blameless life. It was their job to take the scriptures 
and interpret them into daily life. For example, how far could you walk on the Sabbath before it became work? If, if anyone was seriously interested in following each of the laws, seriously interested in leading a blameless life, then those, those weren't casual questions. Those were important questions. The scribes and the Pharisees were attempting to do an important public service. But Jesus catches them in what their intention was and quotes Isaiah. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. This is another example of teachings which were very important in the first century, but, but no longer apply, or at least no longer apply to Christians. Or do they? Are there, there actions we take so seriously that they become blockages to our faith? To our worship. The jargon would be that are there actions which become idols in our eyes? So we worship them rather than worshiping God. Last week we were talking and Shirley mentioned how upset her grandmother would be if she saw her coming to worship without white gloves and a hat on. To that generation, you could not really worship God unless you were properly attired. I have known people who stopped coming to church when they physically could no longer kneel. Their attitude was, was, why bother coming to church if you could not properly worship God and honor God and, and to do so require kneeling? That's not surprising because we in the Episcopal Church have a, have a reputation for being excessively focused on specific physical movements. From kneeling to crossing ourselves, we do a number of things which probably feel strange to a, to a visitor. Now that said, kneeling is very important to me. And what is important to the individual should determine what customs they follow. I think that's exactly what Jesus was pointing to in this passage. I am convinced that God does not care about our posture. But the question is, what does that action mean to you? How does that action affect your spiritual life? I tell people who come from other traditions to, to learn about the intentions of each action and then, then try them out for a while. If the action feels right and adds to your worship experience, then certainly do it. If it action feels strange, even wrong and distracts from your worship experience, and for God's sake, don't do it. As I said, kneeling is an important symbol for me. Bowing before the cross is another one. In both cases, for me, it could be very different for you, but for me, there are signs of my subservience to God. There are symbolic kick in the butt to remind me that I am me and God is God. I find the two postures for taking communion to be a fascinating thought for reflection. Kneeling, as I said, is a, is a gesture of supplication. Please, Lord, share with me. And I personally find that both helpful and appropriate most of the time. Again, for me. Understand that a person who physically cannot kneel can still approach the communion rail with an attitude like that. Standing has a somewhat different feel. It's still spiritually appropriate, just different. Standing as we receive communion is a more joyous, more thankful attitude. It's like, I am welcome here because God has welcomed me. Now, Please recognize that nothing I am saying comes from on high. It's my understanding, and it, it is shared in hopes that it will cause you to think about your reactions and how they affect your spiritual life. An, another action I did not grow up with, I, I grew up with the very Protestant United Church of Christ, is it, crossing oneself. This is actually a fascinating non-scriptural action with with several different meanings depending on the circumstance. 
In summary, crossing oneself is a physical manifestation of a spiritual event. But all these actions are symbolic. None of them are like the wands in Harry Potter. You know, if you remember the story, if you don't make just the right gesture, the magic will not happen. Unfortunately, there have been times in the Episcopal Church and in many other churches when we have taught human precepts as doctrines. Fortunately, that has generally stopped. Jesus' point is actually fairly simple, obvious, yet difficult to live up to. After all, it's actually easier to focus on ritualistic rules than it is to live up to true religion. I've heard people talk about church attendance in that way, or or fasting practices, or spiritual or financial giving. You know the attitude. You certainly heard people say it. If I, if I just do thus and so, I will go into heaven. We forget that all these things, even church attendance, are tools to help our spiritual lives, to, to deepen our relationship with God. They're not goals in and of themselves. If church attendance over time does not help us live our lives better, it's a waste of time. Even financial giving falls into this category. Yes, no question, money is essential to have the worship services, the outreach programs, the Christian education for young people and adults. Absolutely true and essential. And yes, each of those are important to deepening our spiritual lives. We need them to occur. And yes, even more importantly, our financial giving should be part of our spiritual connection to God. If, if we are not proud to talk to God about our efforts, then it probably is detrimental to our spiritual lives. But even with all that, all of these things are only tools to deepen our connection with God. Now, that's all good theory. No question about it. But the how of it can be difficult. Fortunately, our prayer book gives us some good guidance when it summarizes scripture. And the best place to look for this guidance is in our original introduction into the Christian faith, our baptismal service. Every time we have a baptism, vows are taken by or in the name of the canon. But What's so easy to miss is that every time we have a baptismal service, we say vows. Each of us say vows. We are, are asked if we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And after we have responded, we believe, we are, we are asked a series of questions that I call the and therefore questions. If we truly believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we will live our lives following certain of the commandments. We promise, we vow to God, we will continue in learning about and worshiping God, in resisting evil and confessing our sins, in proclaiming God by our word and our actions, in seeking and serving all people, and in striving for justice and peace while respecting the dignity of every human being. Again, standards that none of us can live up to, really. None of us can live up to the blameless life the psalmist requires. But these promises are goals we can work toward. If we, if we do them, then we, the community around us, and the entire world will be a better place, whether we kneel or stand.